Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on this rather hot afternoon. My name is Louise Halfpenny and I'm the Director of Communications. We're here today to, uh, to ask for your help, really, to ask for your help in shaping our appraisal process. And the agenda of the, uh, this afternoon is... Just, Sorry, Louise and Kat. That's, that's all right. Uh, using Zoom. As you can see, we're, uh, we're getting used to using Zoom. We've done a lot over uh, Zoom and Teams and um, please bear with us if we don't get all the slides up and running or there are glitches with the sound. I'm sure you've had the same thing when you've been trying to use it yourself. For this session, we are going to have um, anyone who is not speaking will be on mute and that includes yourselves. Uh, it doesn't mean we don't want you involved, we do, and we will be asking for you to submit your questions via the chat function. So please do that, sending them to me, Louise Halfpenny, and there will be a short, short break at the end of the presentation, and we will collate your questions, and we will then reconvene and get through as many as we can. I should also say that we are recording this session. We had a session like this yesterday and we put that up on our website and we will do the same with this session. You can also send us questions afterwards. You have our email address, but we'll send you an email again after this session. And any questions that you do send us, we will look to build those into our frequently answered questions. We have a task for you and our ask is that you complete that by midday on Wednesday the 1st of July. So the purpose of the session today is to recap, so there are some familiar names and faces out there, so to recap, to bring you up to speed with where we are and also to make sure that any new members have information um, just, to, just to put them in the picture. Um, I should say that about the little about the stakeholder reference group, we will try to listen to you all, we will listen to you all, it doesn't mean we can uh, give everybody what they want, unfortunately, our experience so far is that there has been a range of opinions. We will want you to remain involved and once we are past the shortlist stage, there will be time for you to get involved in something called co-production, which is a more detailed way of looking at our service planning. We will, throughout the summer, ask you to complete surveys and send us your feedback, and we will tell you what happens as a result of your feedback. We don't have another meeting set up right now, but we will be putting some in the diary and we will let you know as soon as possible. And more information information on any of this can be found on our website under the terms of reference. So today's session, as I was saying, is, is to recap, to bring people up to speed and to give uh, information to make sure we're all starting from the same place. And uh, we are talking to you today, we talked to other stakeholder, uh, stakeholder reference group members yesterday, and we're also speaking to our staff and our partner organisations. So over the next few months, we are talking to a lot of people to try and get as much input as we can into the way that we shape our appraisal process. We have three other hosts for this session, and they are Helen Brown, Freddie Banks, and Esther Moores. And Helen is going to be your next speaker. Thank you, Louise. Uh, yes, so I'm just going to give you a, a, a brief recap of, uh, of work over many years. Um, I know that some of you have been involved in previous stages, so this will be old news for you, but we've got some new members for the reference group, so we just want to recap for everybody's benefit. Um, planning goes back, um, back to before 2010 and, and before the, the financial crash when there were well-developed plans for a, a new hospital at, at Watford. That, that never came to pass. Um, so when I joined the trust in 2015, getting a solution to our very significant estates needs was a, was a big priority. And we started work on that link to the UK, your future uh, health uh, strategy led by the CCG. 
In 2017, we approved a strategic outline case um, that looked at how to develop services at uh, Watford and St Albans. Um, we submitted that to regulators, but uh, we were told um, in due course, it took some time to get feedback, that the scheme as it then stood was not affordable. And we were asked to go away and have another think and see what we could achieve within a £350 million uh, capital envelope, um, which was broadly in line with the trust turnover. And that was the position uh, across the NHS at that time. So we completed, uh, we did a lot of work in 2018-19 in to, to work through the best way to do that. And we completed a strategic outline business case that went to our July trust board and then was approved by the CCG and submitted to regulators. That plan um, set out plans for approximately 300 million pounds investment into improving emergency care services on the Watford General Hospital site and uh, about 50 million pounds of improvements across the Hemel, Hempstead and St Albans hospital sites. In, uh, in September 2019, uh, we were very pleased to be confirmed as one of the hospitals included in the first wave of the government's new health infrastructure plan. And that was uh, announced by the Prime Minister and uh, a, a figure of approximately 400 million was confirmed at that stage. Um, people do ask sometimes about the difference between the 350 and the 400 million, um, and the difference between that is linked to uh, in inflation and what year's costings um, are, are being referred to. So broadly, the, the same financial envelope as the SOC was in, in July of that year. Uh, we've, been, we've been working um, since that announcement um, in conversations with NHS England and the Department of Health uh, to get approval to proceed to outline business case stage, which is what we're just starting now. And um, also talking about the level of funding available uh, to us through the HIP programme and uh, opportunities to get a better solution if more funding was available. Uh, we received last week some feedback from regulators who confirmed that we could include an option with new, more new build, more investment at Watford General Hospital, including replacing rather than refurbishing the main clinical block here at Watford um, within the outline business case. Um, that would cost approximately £590 million. Um, so we've been given permission to include that within the option appraisal. Um, but we have been advised that at this stage, there's no guarantee that that amount of funding is available or that that option would be approved. Uh, I'm sure when we get to the question and answer part of this session, um, people will have questions about that issue. So we'll pick up more then. But in the meantime, I'm going to hand over to Freddie, who's going to talk to you a bit more about our clinical vision. Um, that is obviously really important in terms of planning for new hospital facilities. Hello, I'm Freddie Banks. I'm a consultant urologist, a urological surgeon here at West Hearts. I think the last 103, 104 days since we all went into lockdown with the coronavirus have conclusively proved to both us and the nation that the traditional model of emergency and planned care simply isn't working. If it had worked, then I'd have been doing elective surgery here at Watford over the last three months. And the national response to this has been effectively to divide hospitals into emergency hospitals, which have been provided on the traditional NHS basis. And then the elective centres have been seconded from the private sector. So Spa Bushy is now effectively the West Hearts elective surgical centre. This gives us a, a fundamental rethink of how we should deliver care. We've learned so much with the coronavirus. Already we have worked out that it would be much better to actually deliver care in your home rather than just near to your home. 
with digital, we can now do initial consultations with you at home and follow up consultations. But in conjunction with this, I think it is absolutely imperative that there is a segregation of emergency and elective services. Neither service should impact on each other. If you're having an elective operation, there's, you should be guaranteed that date. You shouldn't have your date cancelled because of emergency cases that came in overnight. And similarly, if you're an emergency patient waiting for imaging, you shouldn't be squeezed in around elective services. The next slide, please. Coronavirus has really made us reevaluate how we deliver services. I think the traditional model of a referral coming in from your GP, you turning up to the hospital, a set of investigations being organized, uh, and then coming back for review has rapidly changed. And I think the new model of care will be that you will have an initial consultation, hopefully much quicker than waiting for, to come into outpatients. And that will then effectively devise a management plan for you. If you need diagnostics, then you will almost certainly come in and have a diagnostic day where you try and get all of the scans and it'll all be centered in one place. It won't be a CT at Hemel and an MRI at Bushy and a bone scan at Watford. It'll all be in one hospital. And ideally, we'll get the results back to you that day. Or if we can't deliver it within the same day, we'll then deliver the results to you back at home uh, either over the telephone or through the internet. And you as patients should be empowered to manage your own bookings. If things are inconvenient, then you should be, have the flexibility to change it without going through difficult hospital booking procedures. And your care needs to be integrated with your GP so that the GP knows exactly what's going on with you as soon as it's happened, rather than waiting for letters and the transfer of information to happen. And that dovetails in with getting a much better oversight from other elements of your care, from the community side of things, from mental health, and any other aspects that you are involved with. Now, emergency care. This has changed beyond recognition. To put this in perspective, when I did my stint as an A&E doctor some 25 years ago, a &E was typically a one or two consultant department with a handful of junior doctors who uh, were in their second year after qualifying. And a &E was a sort of small nuisance department that impacted on elective care. No one was really dedicated to looking after emergencies. It was something that you slotted in around emergency, around your normal elective care. But now we see that 80% of inpatients are coming in as emergencies. And patients sometimes flood in. We typically get over 100 ambulances being delivered a day. Three, 330 people and up to 60 patients an hour coming in. And the complexity of patients has hugely increased. Both the numbers of patients, but the age of patients and the expectations of those patients has increased. To put this in perspective, when I did my A&E, if you were over 65, you went straight to the care of the elderly or geriatricians. And the surgeons never ever operated on a patient who was over the age of 75. In the modern day, I have a minor celebration if I have any of my patients younger than 75. What is absolutely imperative is that emergency care means proper dedicated emergency teams geared up for looking after you as an emergency doing the right investigations and the right procedures. Again when I was a junior the shoulder surgeon if he was on call would have a go at doing your hip. For heart attacks I would just give you a drug called streptokinase to try and hope to dissolve the artery in the, the blood clot in your heart. Now what happens is you have a dedicated trauma surgeon who will fix your hip and if you come in with a heart attack instead of me giving you a so-called clock busting drug you'll actually go straight through to the cardiac lab to try and have your artery ballooned open and a stent put inside it to restore blood flow it's fantastic but you have got to generate an environment where you have proper emergency teams 
looking after you with the right access to the proper diagnostics. And A&E needs to be seen not just as a small department looking after a few emergencies, but as the absolute beating heart of a hospital. This is how patients come into hospital, and this is how we should look after you. Next slide, please. Our buildings at present simply do not support any of this model of care. We must build an emergency department, an assessment space that is properly fit for purpose. It needs to be designed around patient flow, receptacle to people who've got dementia, for paediatrics, and it is designed so that you can get state-of-the-art diagnostics properly within an emergency environment, not squeezed in looking after elective patients. And this should all be digital. You should have a proper electronic patient record. We should be able to see your past records instantaneously and it should dovetail in with your GP and community records. You should have proper privacy when you come in, dignity. Nobody should be worried about the embarrassment of walking across a bay with their bum hanging out at the back of a surgical gown to go and have a wee. You should have that privacy in your own room. And with that comes a huge improvement in infection control. You shouldn't be worried about coming into hospital and catching bugs. When we do bring you in, we need to have clinical adjacencies. We need specialist teams who are involved in your care joined up to look after you. And in order to do this, we have to have an environment that attracts the best staff. This is one of the huge challenges of the NHS today, is getting the right staff and the right numbers to come and work. And if we can build a hospital that supports the staff with the facility to look after patients properly, then we will keep and retain staff. And then we have an opportunity and an obligation to support those staff with health and well-being. And that way we will keep them and keep the emergency care at the top of the game to look after you. Thank you, Freddie. Um, so this is Helen again. I'm just going to give you um, some high level information about the business case process. So again, apologies for people who've heard this before, um, but it's important to know that we have to follow a very structured process. It's set out in the Treasury's um, guidance, which is called the Green Book. It's a three stage process, strategic outline case, outline business case and full business case. Um, we are now in the outline business case phase. Um, where we need to do, um, where we effectively we identify the preferred option and we start the very detailed design process. Um, so the first step in the in the outline business case stage, as well as confirming the clinical brief, being really clear about the um, future activity and the future models of care, is to um, review the long list of options from. The strategic outline case, um, revisit that and look again at short list of options. Now the intention is that you don't completely redo all the work that you did at outline strategic outline case stage, but you, you look and you see has anything significant changed? What options should we be considering? Are we, are we confident that this is the right way forward? So we're in that phase at the moment. This is where we're asking for your input. The ambition um, uh, is to complete this work um, by uh, September so that we can take a decision at our October board around the shortlist of options. Um, once we've completed after that, there's then a significant amount of work to do to identify then the preferred option off the shortlist and to do the detailed design and we call those one to 200 drawings. A full business case stage, you take that level of design a step further um, to one to 50 drawings and you do, uh, you procure a partner to construct the new hospital facilities and you do the really detailed finance workforce and implementation planning. So that's broadly what it takes um, from end to end. There is a very important approval process um, through there. So outline business case uh, needs to be approved by the Department of Health and NHS England and at full business case stage we're um, also requiring 
full treasury sign off before we get permission to proceed. So I've, I've given a flavour of that, but this slide um, just gives a bit more detail about what we're expecting to happen when. So the green section is the phase that we're currently in, the outline business case stage um, 20 to 21. I've talked about approving the shortlist um, and then moving on to uh, agreeing a preferred option. Um, from there, the detailed design work happens and uh, we're aiming to be in a position to complete uh, the outline business case before Christmas 2021 so that we can submit it to regulators for approval. Um, following uh, the OBC approval, there's then the full business case stage, as I've just described. Um, approximately 12 months might take a bit longer. Some of these timetables um, will move a bit over the next two years. Um, but our ambition is absolutely to be in a position to start building by 2023. Uh, and then at the current uh, time, the estimate is for a two to three year build programme. Although clearly the, the detail of the preferred option um, will determine the, the construction timeline. So I'm now going to hand over to Esther, who's going to talk to you um, about um, the specific things we want your feedback on today. Okay, thank you, Helen. So I'm going to talk about two things. Um, so the task we're asking of you is to really feed back to us your thoughts. And we're asking for your thoughts on our investment objectives and also on our essential criteria. So the investment objectives really are um, a list of things that we're looking to achieve as a result of this significant investment in our facilities. And the essential criteria are a means of trying to help us decide which options are most likely to achieve those investment objectives. So if we move on to the next slide, I will talk to you particularly about the investment objectives. And um, these are the headline versions of them at the moment. So there is more information on our website. But essentially, you'll recognise a lot of these themes from the conversation um, earlier and the description that Freddie gave as to what's important to um, provide really good clinical care. So we know that it's really important that we make improvement to our emergency care services. We have done the best with the space we have available and um, expanded over the years to accommodate three times as many patients coming through our ED department. But that's not the same as being able to now design those services as they need to be for modern healthcare. We do have a separation between planned and emergency services um, with emergency care at Watford and planned care at um, St Albans and Hemel hospitals. And our experience with COVID has really enhanced the idea that there are benefits in being able to protect both the emergency care services and the planned care services because they're fulfilling very different needs for patients so many opportunities to make better use of digital technology. We have made leaps and bounds over recent weeks and been able to bring care right into people's homes um, in a way that has been really fabulous to witness. Um, there's more that we can do and we know that there are lots of opportunities around home testing, about how we use digital technology within the hospital as well. So that's really important that we capture that and we try to think as far into the future as possible because we know that's going to keep evolving and changing. With regards to some of those um, specialty and subspecialty services that um, we provide, we're really keen to make sure that those services aren't dispersed. So whereas in days gone by, you might have seen a general orthopedic surgeon, now, you'll see the hand specialist, the wrist specialist, the back specialist. So smaller, but very specialist um, teams. And we need to make sure that they are available um, and have the diagnostics um, available to them so that we can support the idea that when patients come in, we can give you as much as possible in a single, single visit. 
Um, and then finally, but very importantly, we have to make sure that we deliver the right value and we make best use of taxpayers' money with what we're planning to do. So we have been through uh, quite a process, as Helen described, to get to the point of having funding awarded to us. Um, and I think it's important to note that what we're trying to do um, is to really make sure that our emergency care services are as good as they possibly can be. So whereas we in 2017 produced a business case about doing everything, when we looked in 2019 and we had a more limited um, amount of money um, to uh, look at options that would um, come in that range, it was very clear that when we were looking between do we invest primarily in emergency care or invest primarily in plan care, that um, emergency care is a real priority for us. It's the most vulnerable, the sickest patients across West Hertfordshire that we are serving. And we want to make sure that we get those buildings as good as they possibly can be. It's not to say that plan care isn't important. We know we need to invest in plan care too, but our most um, pressing need is around emergency care. And what we're aiming to do is to make sure that our building meets um, what um, within the NHS estate code we classify as um, standard B as a minimum. Um, Standard A is a new build and we want to do as much new build as we can because that will be the longest lasting um, solution but we want to make sure that all areas um, that um, are refurbished are done to a good standard that puts us in good stead in the longer term. So um, your involvement um, will be to let us know what you think about those investment objectives. Do they sound um, sensible? Do they pass the common sense test from your perspective? So that's the first task of um, the stakeholder reference group um, from the sessions we've had today and yesterday. We then will be doing some more work and really wanting your thoughts as to the clinical model and how we are approaching the um, long list and coming back to you about um, the long list appraisal to get your thoughts on that as well. Um, but where we're at at the moment, it's the, the investment objectives that we really want to hear from you about and also the essential criteria. So moving on to the essential criteria, this is a means of us assessing a whole range of options and saying which are the ones um, that we should do some more work on. So which are the ones that we have um, the most confidence that are going to be deliverable and that are going to achieve those investment objectives that we've set out. So the next slide just talks through those in a little more detail. So if we just, um, if we could just please move on to the next slide. Um, the, we've got seven proposed essential criteria. The first one is to say, how does an option fit with our strategy? So is it in line with what we know we need for clinical services? And does it fit with wider health system plans and those of our partner organisations? Also, does it give us the flexibility for the future? Because however healthcare looked 30 years ago, it's different now and it's hard to imagine how it will look in another 30 years. And we want to do everything we can to have flexibility so that our buildings can continue to last us. I think the patient experience, obviously, that um, underpins everything that we do. Um, and that's fundamental that we want to make sure that we continue to do everything we can to give West Hertfordshire patients the best possible experience. And again, with quality, we need to make sure that all of our options can keep um, patient safety maximised, that we've got the right um, co-adjacency, so the right services next to each other so that we can get people where they need to be quickly and that we've organised our services in a sensible way. Um, and of course, access. We want to make sure that we've um, organised things so that we can um, ensure that West Hertfordshire patients can readily access the services they need. The next two are really around um, 
that piece about how do you make sure that the taxpayer gets their value and it's from two perspectives really it's about how do we make sure that we make the best of the money we put into the buildings but also in doing that how do we make sure that we can continue to afford to run those buildings staff those buildings into the longer term the seventh and final um, essential criteria is that anything that we can any option that we do more work on we need to make sure that it is actually deliverable that it is viable that it will give us the right sort of space the right infrastructure that we will be able to um, get the changes we need in the time scale that we need so um, your task um, we want to know if you think the investment objectives are the right ones. Um, we want your views as to whether you think those essential criteria will help us to rule out um, options that are just undeliverable so that we can have a short list that's manageable and that's viable. Um, and um, it's really important that we hear all of your opinions and your comments to go alongside with it. So if there's something that you really disagree with then please tell us and please tell us why likewise if there's something that you think is absolutely the right thing um, we really want to understand your views on this so um, Louise I think you're going to um, talk about next steps now for uh, the remainder of today's session yes thank you very much Esther so uh, we had asked you to attend this session lasting until half past three. So we have some time now to take questions. Um, I haven't had many questions in so far. So if you can uh, send in your questions, really in the next five minutes, we will um, have something to get started with. And we are going to reconvene at quarter past three and get through as many of your questions as we can. And as I said, we will of course take questions after. So please don't uh, leave the meeting. We will still be here. So we will reconvene at quarter past three and get through as many of your questions as possible. Thank you very much. So welcome back. Um, thank you very much. We've got lots of questions coming in. So uh, we're going to start probably with the ones that came in earliest and see how far we get. We will allow half an hour. I shortchanged you earlier. I'm sorry when I said we were going to finish at half three. So we'll allow about half an hour. We'll see how, how it goes. If there are some burning issues that we haven't covered, we will um, attempt to address those. Uh, we appreciate that you've given your, your time up for us. So quite a few are coming in um, in response to what Freddie was saying about the separation of planned and emergency care. And I think linked to that um, is technology and there's been questions about future technology. So we'll start uh, with Freddie, if I may, Freddie, with you to look at planned, uh, planned care and emergency care and just touching a little bit on future technology, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Louise. So the question is really, has the, the model of uh, elective and emergency care being trialled anywhere else? Well, I think there's a very good example in, sorry, I'm a bit dark, uh, in London with uh, Guy's Hospital and St. Thomas's, which are the same trust. Uh, and Guy's Hospital there is, uh, does not have a, an accident and emergency department. It is in effect the elective care centre of, of that trust. Uh, and as a absolute beacon of excellence, if you, the urology department there has a fantastic uh, department which is hugely popular with both patients and staff alike uh, and they have really pioneered the sort of one-stop service all-in-one-go uh, model of care and you can actually just google guys urology center uh, and you can they, they've got a sort of Facebook um, or YouTube view of what a center would look like and that shows you what a sort of standard of care looks like when you try and do a sort of one-stop uh, emergence uh, one-stop elective care all in one day so I think it has been trialed elsewhere and seemed to be very successful and certainly the, the the culture amongst clinicians is very much to try and guarantee that when we offer you an operation we get to do the operation on that day and and that should be a standard that 
we offer you as doctors and you demand as patients. So I hope I've answered that question. And then Thank you, Freddie. Sorry, yes, and then if you could take us on to technology. So the next question I've got is, uh, do we have a view on how future technology will impact on the future design of the hospital? Um, I think the answer, you know, we are learning very rapidly with this because the technology is advancing so quickly. Uh, the first thing that I've already alluded to with the, the coronavirus is how rapidly we've realized that we can use digital technology to see patients. If you ask me in February how much or how, what percentage of outpatients would be uh, telephone or digital, I'd have said about 10 to 15, 20 percent, that sort of number. Uh, at this moment in time, I think well, we're doing pretty much everybody's 100 percent at the moment, but there are some patients when you've got to come up and be examined. But I would tentatively say that we will probably deliver 60 probably pushing towards 80, even 90% of outpatients in the future will be exactly like this cons this presentation, live over the internet to you in your home. Uh, I can't really see a huge value in seeing patients in the hospital except for specific diagnostic uh, procedures uh, or in surprisingly few situations when you've really got to examine a patient. And the remainder of it we can actually do over this, over the internet, you get a very good feel for patients doing it online. Thank you. Um, Helen, could I come to you please with a question about uh, working with Harlow in Essex, so that is where Princess Alexandra Hospital is based and the STP um, on our on our future plans and what we might be learning from Harlow. Thank you. Uh, yes, so um, we do we do work uh, and keep in touch with Princess Alexandra Hospital in Harlow, and we are sharing as our experiences as we go through this um, strategic outline and outline business case phase. There there are lots and lots of things that we can do together and learn from. So as we're developing our clinical brief, as we're thinking about the best way to design hospitals, as we're thinking about technology, as we um, are planning for future population needs, we're, we're absolutely sharing our thinking and making sure that we're not doing completely, you know, thinking completely different things because we are part of the same uh, Hearts and West Essex uh, local integrated care system, which is the new name for the STP. Um, it's important that our plans for the, to, to the, for the hospitals fit into the whole kind of wider picture of how we see health and care services developing in this part of England. Uh, and uh, we both will need ultimately approval and sign off from our own clinical commissioning groups, but also the integrated care system. So we, we are working uh, together, although there are differences in the schemes and, and as, as well. Um, so we won't do everything exactly the same, but we are absolutely sharing our experiences as we go. Thank you. Um, I, there is a concern from uh, one questioner who asks about access uh, to Watford from all parts of um, West Hearts that we cover. Um, maybe you or Esther could touch a little on how we will look into that as we progress uh, further into the OBC. Uh, so I'll, I'll say a few things and I'm happy for Esther to come in as well. Um, so we, we did look at this at strategic outline case stage. I, I am aware that there are um, people who would like to see uh, emergency care services delivered from a more central location and I'm sure we'll come back to the issue of new hospital on a new site options as well at some point in this Q&A. Um, and part of that is about recognising that we have three key towns that we serve, Watford, Hemel, Hempstead and St Albans, um, as well as um, you know other, other smaller communities um, across our catchment area and uh, undoubtedly for people who live in Watford it's easier to access emergency care services at Watford Hospital than it is for people who live uh, in Hemel Hempstead or, or St Albans. <coughs> um, 
so we, we're we're aware of that factor and obviously we're aware that traffic in in Hertfordshire is sometimes uh, a challenge whether you're going actually to access services at St Albans City Hospital because uh, traffic can be heavy in St Albans or whether you're trying to travel between the towns. Um, so we've done analysis in the past, we will do more analysis again. Um, the, new, the new road into the hospital which opened a couple of years ago has helped. It has helped with ambulance travel times and access into the hospital. So when people are worried that they need that emergency care really quickly, um, the ambulance access times uh, has, has improved with the new road. And actually congestion uh, north of the hospital around Vicarage Road has, has also improved since the new road opened. Um, but I can't take away from the fact that um, different people have different amounts of travel time to get to the services as they're currently organised. And actually, if you look anywhere in the country, um, clearly some people live closer to their emergency care hospital um, than, than other people do. Thank you. So um, Esther, Esther might want to add, sorry, just in terms of, so, and, and I'll ask her to come in, just in terms of thinking about access more broadly than just the, the travel times between the towns and how we're developing services and how we're also planning to talk to uh, local authorities. Hi. Thank you, Helen. Um, so by way of access more broadly, I'm just going to uh, get Helen to nod if I've un understood uh, what it'd be by way of how we're conf um, looking to design services differently. Is that? Well, part yes, partly that, because obviously uh, the care closer to home piece, which Freddie's covered quite nicely, but also that how can we improve, regardless of where the hospital is situated, how can we make it easy for people to access? Okay. Um, so taking the first part of it, um, the, about how we design, design the services and how we look at those, I, I think a lot of that stems back to the outline that we've already had, which is around not having people coming to the hospital sites as often as they do, really making sure that we can do everything on the same day. And also, <clears throat> excuse me, with a lot of uh, more complex patients, rather than seeing a few different specialists, for those specialists to have a conversation, to have a multidisciplinary assessment before patients um, or then um, given their the relevant diagnostics in the same way that we do for cancer patients, but to make sure that that's um, our way of working into the future. Um, so there's a whole range of things that we're wanting to do so that we are, our default is that one-stop model. Um, I know um, Freddie won't mind my saying at the moment for some pathways, urology is a really um, a good example that patients actually go between a whole range of hospitals they go across our sites they go to Mount Vernon they go to um, the Lister and actually what we want to do is to try to make care simple um, so that people can have a degree of familiarity particularly if they um, they are uncertain about their care or their diagnosis um, and to try to limit how much people are having to move between between different hospitals wherever we can. Um, by way of um, access and how we want to make things um, just you know getting to the sites more easily easy, we are looking at um, working with um, the authorities, setting up um, a group looking very specifically at transport. Um, and our intention had been um, to do that as soon as possible, but obviously over recent months um, our attention has uh, needed to be um, on other things, but to try to involve um, local people in how we can improve that. How do we improve wayfinding once you come to the hospital? And you know, how can technology help us with that so that you, know, you get uh, for your hospital appointment a, a way of wayfinding on an app the same way as uh, lots of people are used to nowadays for navigating in a car. So there are lots of things that we can look at so that we can make um, our sites feel more accessible when patients come in. 
Thank you, Esther. Uh, there's a question here about the board meeting, Helen, and particularly about the site review. So a question maybe for you or Esther to explain about how we're going to run the board meeting in July and a little about the site review and when we might be able to see the results of that. Yes, so um, quickly on the board meeting, uh, it, it, will be a, it will be held in public. Um, so using this technology or using, I don't know whether it's Zoom or Teams, but it will be available um, to view digitally. Um, the meetings are held in public, they're not public meetings. So people are asked if they've got specific questions to ask them in advance through the Trust Board Secretary. Um, uh, and it isn't an opportunity to interact with the board, it's a, an opportunity to watch the board do its business. Uh, in terms of uh, the site review and the specific question is, will, will the board be receiving that? The answer is no. That work has only just started, um, so it will not be uh, it will not be ready um, probably until the September board at the earliest, I imagine. Um, but to just say a little bit more about that piece of work that we've commissioned, um, which obviously links into the to the question ar around. Uh, travel times and accessibility of, of Watford and whether we should be looking at other alternative sites for emergency care. We have um, commissioned, or well, we're being supported through the outline business case stage by Royal Free Property Partnership, who um, uh, recently completed the Chase Farm Hospital development and have got a lot of expertise to bring. So we've asked the Royal Free Property Limited, who are working with a big professional services firm called Montague Evans, to do a piece of work reviewing a small number of potential sites for a new hospital, a new emergency care hospital, and to give us advice on whether those sites are suitable, what any planning issues might relate to those sites, uh, what the timeline is likely to be, uh, would, would be likely to be to bring them into use, and uh, what other kind of risks and issues or potential they see in those sites. So that's clearly a really important piece of work to then feed into our decision making about whether or not to include a new hospital on a new site into our shortlist process. Um, that report um, will be ready um, to be uh, a key input into the decision making about the shortlist of options um, that will take place uh, in September time. Uh, and can I ask you a follow up on sites, please, which is um, whether we are yet at the stage to meet with any landowners or, or you know, property owners, landowners who've, who've got sites that we might be looking at. Where, whereabouts are we on that process? So the, the trust is not meeting with property owners and sites at the moment, although in the past we have had a, a number of uh, conversations with, with different uh, people. Um, well, as I've just described, the, the Royal Free Property Group and Montague Evans at the moment are having those discussions. I do. This kind of goes back to the point I made about SOC to OBC. We don't want to redo all the work that we did at SOC stage. And at this point in time, we can't do a really extensive site search and look at you know, multiple different sites. It's very time consuming and... Um, uh, we, we need to work with a small number of, of potentially viable sites and we, we, we are uh, we're aware of some key sites that have been um, suggested before and this piece of work is, is going to look at some of those key sites for us. Thank you. Uh, another question here on technology, um, really asking if all the technological needs um, are going to be looked at during the OBC, uh, right down to cabling, anything that we might need to be a digital hospital, and what we can do to protect ourselves from technology becoming quickly outdated? Uh, so the quick answer to that is yes. Um, we're really keen that this, you know, we build a digital hospital and um, there's, there's a huge list of things we can do and we're having uh, lots of discussions internally at the moment about how do we prioritise that, what will they cost, what's the return on investment. But one thing that we're really clear about is that we need to get the infrastructure future-proofed 
So um, it will need to have all the appropriate network cabling um, facilities. We're talking about whether or not um, we can be 5G enabled and what that would take and whether that's a key decision that we need to take at this point before uh, construction starts. So all of those things absolutely part of the work that we're doing. And if anybody's got a strong interest in technology, I'm sure at some point um, we'd be very happy to kind of link you in more detail to our digital work stream. Uh, in terms of future proofing, I think again, that goes to things like 5G. Um, technology changes really, really fast, but there are some core things that if you haven't got in place, you can't benefit from the technology that's coming. Um, and we're working at the moment, we have Deloitte, who are a big consultancy firm with expertise in this field, giving us some advice on exactly these issues to say, how do we do, how do we do this best? And, and the final piece I will say on that is, as a HIP1 hospital, there is now a national network which is being facilitated by NHS England. Um, and one of the things that as a group of hospitals who are all going through this um, process to really think about opportunities to build for the future, there's a digital uh, conversation that we're having and we're working with NHS X, um, who are the organisation that lead on, on digital for the NHS. So it's very much just not me, Esther, Freddie, the team here, trying to work it out. It's, it's pulling in the best available advice and the most up-to-date thinking about digital. Um, we have got a bit of challenge with the money. Um, so without sharing too much of our pain, um, funding for buildings and digital come through different routes at the moment. And the 400 million envelope uh, figure that I talked about the Prime Minister having announced doesn't include the costs of implementing our electronic patient record or really maximising digital technology. It does include, or it's assumed to include, infrastructure costs. So again, we're having lots of conversations at the moment to say, how do we make sure that as we build for the future, we do build a digital hospital and how do we get you know, how do we make the best use of money available, potentially available to us? Uh, can I stick with the money, please, Helen, and ask you uh, a question that's come in about debt? So we've heard in the headlines recently um, about the government's borrowing. Uh, this is probably a question related to COVID and the amount of investment uh, the government government has had to make. Uh, do you think um, that that will impact on any any of our plans? Okay, so this is a, a personal opinion. I'm not I'm not a politician, and I am broadly a civil servant. But if I I'm going to go back very briefly to 2017, when we said we needed to do substantial work to improve our estate, we thought it would cost in the region of 600 to 650 million pounds. The answer then was that's not affordable for uh, the government. Do you know, the, the government isn't, it can't afford that much investment. Go away and do some more work. Uh, look at a scheme uh, that gives you the best possible outcome for approximately 350 million. We did that piece of work. Um, and then um, obviously new government, new prime minister, very committed to infrastructure, coming out of austerity at that point. Um, came, came forward and said, yeah, we want, we want to make this investment uh, and uh, gave us a, an in-principle agreement to a, approximately 400 million. Um, clearly, um, we've been in discussion with them since that, well, them being the Department of Health and NHS England since that announcement was made and said, look, do you know, is there any way we can stretch that envelope because it doesn't solve all of the pressing challenges we've got and we think we could get a better solution if there was a bit more flexibility around that and by better i mean obviously better the more new build we can have the better the patient experience will be and the better the clinical experience will be but also potentially better value for money in the long term because you know uh, I have a lot of sympathy with people who've said to me over the last year, are you sure it's a good use of money, Helen, to invest uh, tens of millions of pounds in the current main clinical block at Watford, when clearly at some point in the next 10, 15, 20 years, that has got to go. And, and you know, 
that's a fair point. So what we are, um, what we're really keen to do is get the best solution we can, best value for money we can, but ultimately it does need to be affordable for the government and they need to be willing to make the investment. What they've said to us um, over recent months is at, at the moment the position is, okay, you can have a look and see if you can put forward an affordable value for money option that costs more than the 350 million but there is no guarantee at this point that we will be able to fund that. We can speculate on whether COVID and the amount of money the government's had to put into COVID response means that they're going to find it more difficult to put more money into hospital redevelopment, or actually whether the public interest in hospitals, the learning from COVID is going to actually increase the appetite to invest um, in, in health facilities. I, I think, you know, while we've got Boris Johnson as Prime Minister and not being political, he's, he is a strong advocate of investment in infrastructure and I'm sure the government will want to do this if they can. But absolutely, there's no guarantee at the moment and the messages we can continue to get um, through NHS England and the Department of Health is there is a limit on capital. Everybody would like to have a brand new hospital everybody is asking for capital investment you absolutely have to demonstrate um, the affordability and value of your scheme and and even then we might not be able to afford to put all the capital in so watch this space but clearly we're we're fighting to get um a really good solution for our for our patients Thank you, Helen. And thank you also to Esther and Freddie. There are a couple more questions before we wrap up, uh, which I'm going to respond to. And one of those is, uh, are we interested in volunteers uh, getting involved in this process? Absolutely, yes, we are. Uh, please uh, tell your friends and neighbours, join the reference group. We've got more for you after your first task we hope to involve you in work around our clinical model we will talk to you about that and that will also form part of our appraisal as we move towards the shortlist so that's really important work yes we'd like more people involved so uh, absolutely and another question about digital and the concern that when we have new buildings in 25, 2025, 2026, we might be all digital and will that disadvantage patients who aren't communicating in that way. And we will absolutely make sure that we can manage patients, their bookings and all the correspondence in a way that best suits them. So although digital really works for a lot of people, we do understand that it's not for everyone, just in the same way that we, um, work with people who have different languages, different communication needs. So we will continue to correspond with patients in whatever means is best for them. And uh, just to recap on the task that you have in front of you, you've got until midday on Wednesday, and we really do want your views on our investment objectives and our critical success factors. As Helen said, please tell us if, we think, if you think we've got it right. We like to hear that, but we also like to hear uh, what you don't agree with and importantly why you don't agree with it. Our website is growing all the time with information. The green book is on there which is the treasury guidelines that we follow so if you want to see um, the process that's been set out for us it's there. There's a fuller version of our investment objectives there and as papers become available we will put them there but we will send you emails to tell you when there is something significant new on the website so please keep looking we're going to follow up with an email and next week we will send you a very short survey just asking how you found this process how we can do it better next time and what would work really well for you in terms of engaging with us. So thank you once again for giving up your time on a hot sweltering day. Appreciate you being with us here and we will continue to work with you. Thank you so much. Bye bye.